pension sub and pension board. Um, we'll try and move as swiftly as possible. Can we have item number one, Sondon, and apologies for the pension subcommittee, please? Thank you, Chair. No apologies for the pension subcommittee. Thank you. And item two, Sondon, and apologies for the pension board. Yes, thank you. For four apologies for the pension board being Andrew Wood, Douglas Fairbairn, Karen Hunter, and George Hurst. Where George Hurst is concerned, he's indicated that he will be resigning from the board. Okay. And uh, item number three, is there any declaration of interest from the Pension Subcommittee? No. Perfect. And item number four, is there any declarations of interest from the Pension Board? No. Oh, sorry, Graham. Sorry, uh, just say Councillor Crothers is in the building. He's on the phone. He'll be as soon as he can to the Pension Board, to the Pension Subcommittee. So. Thanks for that. And we'll move on to item number five, which is the annual training plan and record of training update. I'll pass over to Gemma for this. So I'd just like to uh, draw members' attention in particular to the, the requirements um, that we need to satisfy for MIFID II, in particular the qualitative requirements and that the, the record of training um, is a, a very integral part of satisfy, satisfying um, that particular requirement. Uh, there are a number of training items that are still outstanding at the moment and again I would just remind members that those that can be completed online can they do that as soon as possible. There is also a training event scheduled um, in December in this uh, particular building which will cover um, asset classes and also environmental social and governance factors which we have had a number of um, questions from yourselves around so they're going to be really key events uh, for your knowledge and understand <coughs> over the longer term so uh, just to note those that, that that event in particular but that there are a number of other new events uh, coming on board and, and about registering interest and so on. Ellie? Just a, a question about the event that people weren't able to get to this week and we were issued with a lot of the handouts and so on. If people go through those handouts, will that count for that training? Does that count as us having done that? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you have the opportunity to go through those trainings and slides, and in particular, if you have any questions that you want to direct to the team, then if you, if you can do that, obviously that was unfortunate uh, last week with the cancellation of the trains and so on. Yeah, I think myself and Andrew did have a discussion about actually incorporating some of those slides into the, the, the train event on, on the 13th of December, so it would be quite useful. And does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, yep. thank you. Uh, th thanks for the report. It's a very polite report uh, from my point of view because it's quite clear that uh, you know members of both uh, both groups haven't been carrying out the pension regulator training in good time. So that's something that has to happen. But my question is, uh, what are the risks of not being able to meet the quantitative test? Certainly. Um, to be clear, we do meet the quantitative test. Uh, it's the qualitative test that, that um, you know the training relates to. Um, the risk is that we would no longer be, we wouldn't be able to opt up as professional client status, and that would limit the range of investments that that we would be um, permitted to use. Uh, so it, it would be a significant challenge for the fund. Is there any other question? Yep. I'll just a supplementary one. I notice in the additional papers that were issued this morning, there's actually a questionnaire, uh, which is the test, I suppose. Uh, when does that have to be completed? We've actually submitted those to all of our fund managers now, so we have um, been able to complete it and send all of the evidence through. Um, the training plan is a key part of that uh, particular evidence. However, having a plan is wonderful, but we do actually need to be delivering against the plan, and that's really what I'm trying to emphasise now, that it's not enough to just have the plan on its own. We do have to be um, actively completing the training. We understand that not every member will be able to attend every single event, and if you have a look at the form, it is about the collective expertise of, of our decision-making body, so in this case, the, the subcommittee. Um, so it, it is really just when availability allows, if, if people are able to attend those things, but those that are available online and in-house, we, we would expect everybody to be able to attend those or complete those. Sorry, I wasn't, I wasn't asking about, 
about the timetable for doing the training, it was the timetable for putting in the questionnaire and meeting the test criteria that I was more concerned about. Sorry, I, I did think that I'd answered that at the start. The form have been submitted to our fund managers. So they've, they've been sent with all of the, the correspondence, support and evidence and so on as well. It would be if fund managers came back uh, and had any further questions, we might need to deal with those. But also I would expect them to assess, uh, you know, the, the, oh sorry, to satisfy themselves that we continue to meet those tests over the long term. So this is the first iteration, but I would expect that to be an ongoing requirement that, that they'll look for further updates against that. Is there any other questions? Okay, we're happy to move on to the recommendations. So, members asked to note 2.1, the additions to the annual training plan in Appendix 1 following the previous meeting of this committee. Happy to note. 2.2, uh, to progress the date in the, training, in the record of training in Appendix 2 and the process for updating the record of training. It's quite mouthy. Everyone happy to note that? And 2.3, that the Dumfries and Galloway Pension Fund must satisfy both the quantitative and qualitative tests in Appendix 3, as required by markets in the Financial Instrument, Instruments Directive uh, 2 legislation in order to retain professional client status. Happy to note. And 2.4, that the Online Pensions Regulator Service Toolkit training is available, and the background information, what is responsible investment, is also available and is now overdue for completion. Happy to note. Okay, we'll move on to item number six, which is the 2017 valuation interim results. I'll pass back over to Gemma. Thank you. So we have uh, Richard Warden and Alan Johnson here from Hymans to uh, deliver on this, and they've given you handouts uh, already. Okay, I'll, I'll carry on talking in the meantime. Uh, is that better? Can you hear me okay? Good, that's better. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, can I check, um, this is a fairly new committee, Who, who's got valuation experience in the room? Have you been through valuations elsewhere, either with this fund or other funds? No? Okay, that's fine, that's good. Uh, so, today's really talking through why we do a valuation and looking at the initial results of the whole fund for evaluation, not at the employer level, we're still in the process of doing the numbers for that. Uh, so we're at the whole fund situation at the moment. We required to do evaluation every three years under the regulations. So 31st March 2017 is the latest valuation date. Here we go, I'll just put these up. There you go. That's better. Okay. So you've got a handout, so this should match a handout with a bit of luck. Uh, so March 2017, 31st of March 2017 is the valuation date. Scottish funds are either a year behind the English and Welsh funds, because they do it in 2016, or two years ahead. Being Scottish, I prefer to think two years ahead. So, <laughs> but uh, it depends where you are in the world when you say that. Uh, so we are, we are there. It's an important time for the fund. This is a case of valuing all of the benefits of the pension fund due to all the members in the pension fund and comparing that against the assets held by the fund. And then the output from evaluation is working out what contribution rates have to be paid by all of the employers, the councils and the other bodies in the pension fund. So I and I are going to spend about 45 minutes Ish, just talking you through what, what's happened so far in the valuation. Please do feel free to jump in with any questions. I uh, appreciate it may be new to quite a lot of you. And you know, it's a fairly technical area of work, so do jump in if you've got questions as we go through. Okay, um, tales are unexpected. There might be a few if you remember that program from the 1980s. It was based on mostly Roald Dahl stories. I always had a wee, a wee unexpected thing at the end of it. Uh, it does feel there's a lot of unexpected things happening out there. And I mention that because pensions isn't immune. So a lot of these things, not, not Leicester City, admittedly, but <laughs> a lot of things out there can affect the pension fund. We're in uncertain times, volatile markets. And so it's quite, it's, it's thing, things that you think can never happen can happen. So here's some examples here. And you've got in the handout. So normally what I do is I should have, should have actually omitted it from a handout and asked you what the odds were. But if you look at these events, five to one, okay, that's a two horse rate. Two horse race Brexit. At the beginning of the day they announced it, pretty much the bookies gave a five to one or 
odds on Brexit happening. So a real outside chance, and yet, as we all know, it happened. Our friend, somebody said a trumpet, <laughs> Donald Trump, <laughs> very Scottish name, because we know he's got Scottish roots. Uh, when he was first in the presidential race, the GOP, right at the beginning, it was 150 to 1, 1 to become not even a president, but just to be the nomination for the Republican Party. 150 to 1, and yet we all know that happened. So these things happen. And of course, Lesser City, you probably recognise these odds. A year before we won the Premiership, 5,000 to 1, and yet we win it. Uh, one thing I can be certain about is that Scott Brown won't lift the World Cup. And these are made up odds, <laughs> but good luck if you can get a bouquet to quote them. Uh, so, anyway, let's not, let's not dwell on Scotland, <laughs> their football team. Okay. <laughs> valuation progress. Uh, so far, we had a planning meeting with officers before the valuation date to talk about the data and what we needed to do during the valuation. Uh, the firm worked away, talked to employers, got all the data in over the summer. We got that data, it was all cleaned up, it was good quality of data. Then we've had meetings with officers to talk about the numbers, the assumptions and the results. And of course now we're, and we're going to do some modelling shortly uh, for the council's contributions which we'll explain in a bit more detail but, uh, but that's in the process to be done at the moment. We have prepared whole fund results which we'll talk about today and have been discussed with officers. So today's purpose is really just to give you an update on where we are on valuation and what we've done to date. The end game here is 31st of March 2018. We've got one year to sign off the valuation report and come up with a set of contribution rates for all the employers in the fund. And we'll apply for the next three years from the 1st of April 2018 to 31st of March 2021. So quite an important time for employers because it affects their the cash they're paying into the pension fund. So that's where we are. And so today's agenda, uh, we're going to talk about the basics, just why do we do evaluation, and Alan's going to cover that. We move on to the assumptions, so how do we value the liabilities? There's a set of assumptions there, we'll talk about them, the key ones. And then we'll go to the results for Dumfries, how, how the fund's looking at the 2017 valuation so far, and finally what the next steps are in the valuation. Okay, so that's the plan for the next half an hour or whatever. Uh, so, without any further ado, I'll pass you across to Alan. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as Richard said, please feel free to jump in with any questions that you have. I appreciate this is possibly quite new to some people and other people have been through it, but please do feel free to ask any questions at all. So, first of all, what is the fund and how does it work? Well, Dumfries and Galloway Pension Fund is essentially one big pot of money, of assets. But within that, it's split up so that every employer within the fund, there's 25 roughly employers, they've all got their own share of assets. And as well as the output of the valuation being a contribution rate for every employer, we also track every employer's assets, the valuation. So you've got one big pot of money, and within that, there's sub-accounts, if you like, for each employer. And the sum of all the employers is the whole fund. So what, how does the fund actually work? Well, it collects contributions. So every employer in the fund pays contributions. Over time, those amass into the asset base. So that's just all the money in the fund has come from employer contributions, essentially. The assets held by the fund are invested, as you know, in different classes. And then from those contributions and the returns on assets, benefits are paid. I'll come on in a few slides to talk about what the benefits are and how they're made up. But essentially that is what the fund's doing. It's collecting money from employers, investing it, and then paying out the benefits to the members. The contributions are made up from both employee and employer contributions. So every member of the fund pays a percentage of their salary into the fund. That's their contribution. And every member's employer also pays a contribution on behalf of the members. And those contribution rates vary by employer. So the council currently has 21.5% of pay. Other employers might have a higher or lower percentage depending on their individ individual funding position. And that's part of what we do at the valuation, is assess the funding position of those employers and what's required to be paid to meet the pension costs. 
And sort of overseeing all of that is governance and the pensions committee and the pensions board, that's their role to assess the governance of the fund, make sure decisions are being made in the right way with the right advice behind it. Is that okay? Anyone? Any questions? So why do we do evaluation? Well, every three years we do evaluation and ultimately we have to. It's in legislation, so that's just part of the rules of the local government pension scheme. It's also used as a sort of health check and to reassess the contribution rates, so just to make sure that everything's going as expected. If Richard's going to come on to talk about assumptions in a wee while, just do we need to change any of the assumptions? Have things turned out differently to what we expected? Do we need to reassess that? We also recommend the contribution rates for the next three years, as Richard said. So it impacts budgets for employers within the fund, the council's budget, how much they're going to need to pay over the next three years. So it helps them to plan and give a bit of certainty over the short term. We also assess every individual member's liability and aggregate that up for the whole fund. So what are the whole fund liabilities? And that's effectively what is going to be paid out in pensions in today's money and compare that with the assets. And that is called the funding level, which is essentially the solvency of the fund. So how do assets compare to liabilities? The ultimate goal is to have sufficient assets currently to fund all the liabilities we know about in the future. Now, over the past few years, historically, if you look back maybe 20, 30 years, most funds were at least fully funded. Some were better than fully funded. So they had more assets than were actually required to pay out the liabilities that had been accrued at that point. Over time, for various reasons, sort of market movements and things, funds have tended to be less than fully funded. So at the last valuation, Dumfries and Galloway Pension Fund was 88% funded. So they had 88% of liabilities held in assets. And I'll, we'll go on when we talk about the whole fund results to see how that's changed over time. And another key thing, as I said, is to monitor experience against assumptions. So what actuaries are always doing is looking at the assumptions, trying to predict what will happen in the future. And based on that, how the fund looks today, the one thing we know is it's not going to be 100% correct. So we constantly just review what the assumptions have been and update them as required. Now, it's quite often said that actuaries are very backward, and that's probably quite true, and that we work backwards. So we work from the liabilities that we know about in future and work back to today to see what the asset base is that's required and the assumptions we've used. And we also try and manage any risks to the fund. Um, they're generally in terms of employers. So are there any employers who are coming up to cessation? So it might be that they had a contract, the council's outsourced, some function, might be cleaning or education or sports coaching, that might have been, say, a 10-year contract. There might only be one or two years of that contract remaining. So does that employer hold sufficient assets or are they likely to have a big cessation payment in a couple of years' time? So that means if they don't hold enough assets, when they leave the fund, they might have to make up the difference. So it's a bit of early warning for them as well, a bit of a health check for them. And sorry, we also review the funding strategy statement, which is just the fund's sort of principles for funding the fund, how we set contribution rates, how employers are treated within the fund. So in terms of achieving the balance, as I said, we work backwards. So we know what the benefits are. We collect the data from the administering authority. And as Richard said, the data has been in really good shape. Um, some funds you have to go through a lot of cleansing and come back and ask a lot of questions about the data, but there wasn't much of that at all. The data's of good quality, which gives us reassurance. It means that the calculations we're doing, we can be fairly certain that the data's in good shape. We're not having to make wild assumptions about the data. So based on that data, we know what each member's liability is going to be, what they're due in benefits. There are some assumptions within that which Richard will speak about, like how many members may retire in ill health, how many might leave before retirement. But we make assumptions about that, calculate their liability, then we know what the asset base is, what the assets are in the fund at the 31st of March. And then over on the right-hand side of this chart, we've got the, under the assets heading, there's the dark blue box, which is future investment returns. We make an assumption about that, 
So what might the fund achieve on an annual basis in terms of investment returns? And then the difference, if you like. So between the assets currently held, what the returns are likely to be in future of what we think they might be, the difference is made up by contributions. So we set employer contributions based on what we think the gap might be between what's currently held and what those assets might return in the future. And that's why contributions differ at valuations. We don't just say for the next 40 years, the council will pay 20% because things change over time. We need to adjust it to make sure that the fund's always been looked after and we're doing as much as we can to get sufficient funds in without employers overpaying. So it's striking the balance between affordability and looking after the members and ensuring there's sufficient funds to pay their benefits. And that is the balancing act. It would be easy to say everyone just pay 50% and we know there'll be sufficient funds, but employers just can't afford that. The council can't afford to pay 50% of payroll into the pension fund. So what are the different roles in the valuation? Well, as I've touched on already, the actuary is here to carry out the calculations, carry out any modelling that needs to be done. So we might do contribution rate modelling for the council just to give a bit of an idea of it's almost a sensitivity test. If the council paid another 3%, what might that look like in the future? If they paid 1% less, what might that look like? We also recommend a funding strategy. So looking at the employers in the fund, what we think each employer should pay and how that differs between different employers and give a bit of justification for that to both the administering authority and yourselves to help inform decision making. The administering authority, they provide the data. Ultimately, they're sort of custodians of the data. They look after it. They collect it from the different employers in the fund. As new members join, they get the new member records set up. As people leave, they ensure that they become deferred members and just keep records of salaries and when people retire, that sort of thing. And they pass that data to us. And they also sort of facilitate discussions and consultations. So we'll maybe draft the funding strategy statement pass it to the administering authority, they'll comment on it and then run it by yourselves in the committee just to make sure you understand it and you're happy with it. And there's also potentially a consultation period with employers to, undersure, to ensure that they understand how the fund's working and what the decision framework is in the fund. Your role in the committee, you've got various roles, um, but in terms of the valuation, it's agreeing the funding strategy, ensuring that you understand how we're setting employer rates and that it seems reasonable and also just sort of overseeing the governance of the whole process. Have we done the right things? Can we justify the decisions that are being made? And the local pensions board sits alongside the committee, but it ultimately ensures that the committee are doing the right thing. Are they putting ourselves and the administrative authority under scrutiny? Is everyone understanding the decisions that are being made and the process that's being followed. So, I touched previously on the fund being the aggregate of all the individual members' liabilities. So this chart just shows from sort of an average member, just it's not based on anyone in particular, but their life in the fund. Just to give a bit of context as well, I mentioned assumptions, we are predicting trying to predict as far as we can into the future, just to give you a sort of flavour of how long a pension scheme might last or how long an individual member's liability might last. There's an interesting stat from the American Civil War, which was 1861 to 1865, I think. There's currently still one member who's receiving a pension, which was due to, some, to a veteran from that war. So I think the way that that scheme's set up, dependence of veterans in America continue to receive a pension. So I think this veteran had children fairly late in life and she was one of, she was a triplet actually. And she's currently 87. And I think certainly last year, the pension was still in payment. She was getting $73 a month, but that's 150 years since the event. So that's just to give you a bit of an idea that this is a long-term game that we're looking at here. It doesn't just finish when the member's payment ceases, when the member dies. There could be dependents. And in the LGPS, under certain circumstances, members' children can receive benefits for well into the future. So looking at this chart, the pink bar at the bottom 
represents. So this member joins when they're 40, and they've got 25 years in the scheme. So going until they're 65, the pink bar represents their contributions. So that's both the member contributions and the employer contributions. So they're paid into the fund over time, and as I said, they're invested and hopefully accumulate over time. Then when they hit retirement, there's potentially a lump sum which is paid out. Now, there's different elements of benefit in the scheme. I won't go into it in detail, but up until 2009, your pension was based on an 80th of your salary at retirement for every year that you had of service. So if you had 20 years service when you retired, 25 80ths times your final salary, plus you get three times that pension as a lump sum. The scheme changed in 2009. So between 2009 and 2015, the scheme changed and it was a 60th of your pension for each year's service in that period, but there was no guaranteed lump sum. And then from 2015, we've got what's called a care scheme, which is a career average scheme. So your pension's assessed on your earnings every year from 2015. You accrue a bit of pension and that goes into a sort of side pot, if you like, and that's tracked over time. But the reason I mention that, the lump sum, you get a guaranteed lump sum for your pre-2009 benefits. You can also elect to commute the pension, so that is give up a pound of pension in exchange for a lump sum. And the way it works, for every pound of pension you give up, you get £12 in lump sum. And that's the choice for members. Different people will commute different amounts. Some might not exchange any pension for a lump sum, some might give up. 30% of their pension for a lump sum. So that lump sum's variable. We make an assumption about that. That's a one-off payment. Yes? We've got, it's probably about 20, differs between males and females, current pensioners and future pensioners, but you're probably looking 23, 24, 25 years from age 65. So Richard will come on and talk about how we inform the longevity assumption, we call it, but how long we assume people will live. No, it's... You're, Unless you live in Glasgow, that is, we're pretty much stuffed if we're from Glasgow. But um, no, it is. I think the average age across the fund that we assume is about 89 ish that you would live to. <laughs> That's good then, a good news story. Um, and then the blue sort of bars, if you like, to the right of the, the orange. That The first one represents the member's pension. That slopes up because every year the member's pension increases in line with inflation. So you get an inflationary increase in your pension, which varies year by year. But typically, the assumption we've adopted is about 2 2.5%. And then at death, we've got 85 in this case, but then the spouse of that member, so um, or if they've got any dependents, if it's like the American Civil War and they've had children late in life, it might be a child's pension, continues in payment for a while after. So that's what we do for each member based on the data that we're given. We then build that up into employers. So we every member's coded to a different employer. We assess that employer level. Then just like the assets, we build all the employers, bring them together, and that's the whole fund level. And I'll when I come on to talk about the whole fund results, that will be what the, the liability is shown. It's all the members in that, whether they're active, deferred, or pensioner, the liability based on this sort of thing for every member. Pass you back over to Richard to talk about the assumption. Yeah, sorry. It's early in the day. 
Did you say there that the average pay over the period has now started? Yeah, so if you've been in the scheme for 15 years, say, you'll have three different elements that make up your pension. So there'll be some in respect of your pre-2009 service. That stays as it is. So that's however seven years, say, you had then. That is seven over 80 times your final salary at retirement. Then for the next six years, you've got six over 60 times your final salary. Then from 2015, you're, so for the year 2015-16, your pay over that period is divided by 49, and that is your pension in respect of that year. Then the following year, so 16-17, you're paying that year over 49. As your pension earned in that year, it's added to the previous year, and you just keep building that up. So it's not the simplest of schemes. But that's, that's the importance of having clean data. Aye, it certainly is. Okay. Okay, thanks, Alan. We'll just move on to uh, the assumptions, and that, that, that's the assumptions are are used to calculate the liabilities that Alan spoke about in that chart. So that that long term liability that's sitting here for every single member of the fund, we need to make a whole raft of assumptions to work out what that liability value is. So I think this is probably quite relevant to what happened in the budget yesterday, where you probably noticed that growth forecasts again have been lord again and it's just kind of so we're in a climate i'm afraid since 20 with 2014 valuation uh, when growth forecasts were quite gloomy we're still in that place in fact growth forecasts are a wee bit gloomier than perhaps we were at 2014 and so and we just picked out a few comments there from economists and fund managers etc and clearly the obr have a fairly gloomy view at least in the short term and so so the kind of theme of this valuation i'm afraid is that growth expectations are a bit lower going forward than they were at the last valuation. So that does put upward pressure on pension costs. Uh, I think they're manageable. We think we can still come up with a set of rates that employers will be able to pay okay and are affordable, but it, there is pressure on the fund. The good news is the Dumfries fund, like all the Scottish funds, is pretty well funded. Still in deficit, but still you know well funded compared to many. But some of the funds in England and Wales are badly funded. And so they, for them, low growth is an issue that implies that more cash has to go in because if you can't get the asset growth that you hope to get you have to plug that deficit in some way over time and so it's it's a challenging environment we're in at the moment uh, but i think we can handle it uh, and you're still in a good place but 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 basically it's very hard to find an economist or a fund manager or, or whoever who has got a really positive view certainly in the short term and we all hear about the reasons for that productivity growth is low Got global issues out there, a lot of uncertainty and so on. So uh, hopefully in 2020 we're in a better place, but uh, that, that's the kind of environment we're in at the moment and we try to factor it into evaluation. Uh, the way in which we set rates, I should say, incidentally, we take a more, a, a sort of, we do look over the longer term, so we don't just look at current market conditions, we look at what the, long, the medium and longer term might hold. And we do think over the medium to longer term the, the economy will start to grow a bit more, not just in the UK, but globally. So we factor it into the rate setting process. So, uh, but we are in a kind of slightly worse position than we were at 2014 in that respect, meantime. Okay. So what assumptions do we look at? And I'm not going to, we don't have time today to go through every single assumption that we use to value, value the liabilities. There are two distinct categories of assumption. You've got the financial assumptions and the financial ones largely determine the size of the benefit. So inflation, so benefits are mostly linked to CPI inflation, consumer prices. So that gets bigger over time. You've got to pay out more benefits. So that's the size of the benefit. Pay increases, Alan talked about final salary link. So people get big in pay increases, the so liabilities are bigger, and, and so on. So you've got the financial assumptions on one side, and we look at the economy, what the outlook is, and what, we, what, what assets are held by the pension fund. Clearly, that's important to reflect your investment strategy. And we consider things like, you know, what, what pay growth, what salaries do in pay growth, uh, what, what employers do in pay growth. And austerity clearly is biting, and pay growth has been low, and we'll come on to that in a minute. So we've, we've adjusted assumption in that respect. On the other side, the demographic assumptions affect how long benefits are going to be paid for. The critical one being life expectancy. People live longer, it costs more money. So uh, the pension fund has to hold more money 
if people live longer, clearly. But there are lots of other assumptions in there, like retirement age assumptions. Rule of 85 changed over time. That's a complex beast in itself to minister for the, the pension fund, but affects the, the age at which people can take benefits unreduced. And you've got marriage statistics, you've got dependents, you need to make an assumption about what percentage of people get a dependents pension and so on. I won't talk a lot of detail about demographic assumptions other than longevity, because that's a key one. That's a big ticket one that makes a financial difference. The other ones are relatively small beer. So I'll just go through the kind of key assumptions, the most significant ones that affect evaluation results. So first one, we, we call it the discount rate, a bit of a technical term. All, all that is, is a, it, it, it's, it's designed to be a prudent assumption and designed to reflect what the pension fund holds. So uh, a view of what the future expected investment return is from the Dumfries Fund based on your investment strategy is designed to be prudent. Uh, and the hope and expectation is that actually the assets will outperform this assumption. So we go back to 2014. Uh, we base a discount rate on long-term interest rates, which are gilt yields, so it's what, what the market views there. Uh, and we add on an allowance for the fact that actually the fund doesn't invest in purely in government risk-free assets like government bonds that invest in equities and property and all that, uh, all those sorts of things. We did some analysis and we talked to the officers about what the, the rate should be at this valuation. And what we did at the 2014 valuation, we took the long-term interest rate, the bond yield, and we added on 1.6%. And we've reviewed it at this valuation. And we generally have a rule of fund where we say, well, 50-50 isn't prudent, but say a two-thirds likelihood of success, success being getting rid of the deficit and remaining fully funding over time, uh, typically two out of 67 percent or better would be a prudent outlook for a pension fund that keeps the fund safe and keeps rates affordable as well. You don't want to go too high. You don't want to go 80 percent or 90 percent, but you don't want to go 50-50 because that feels more like a, a punt rather than a safe thing. Uh, we looked at that, discussed it with officers, and moving from 1.6 to 1.8 still gives you a likelihood just above 70%, so it feels pretty safe to us. So the proposed assumption is that we move that asset out performance assumption, so that's the allowance above risk-free assets for all 1.6 to 1.8% of this valuation, giving you a total, as it happens, of 3.5% when you add the two together. Guilt yields, you'll probably know which long-term interest rates have reduced over the last three years. You're probably aware of that, I suspect. Uh, so we are in a low interest rate environment. We do think over the medium to longer term, rates will rise and we'll build that into the rate setting process over the longer term. But that's the rate at the valuation date, which we're required to report on. So for presentation reasons, we need to report on that. But actually, what's more important is for, for virtually all the employers in the fund is the longer term position. So that deficit is in the fund doesn't get crystallised immediately, it gets crystallised very gradually over time. So that's the proposed assumption at this valuation is to move it up 0.2% per annum uh, and it still keeps funds safe. Uh, so that's that. Does that make sense? That one? That's, quite a, that's a significant assumption uh, and you know it's the one that most people are familiar with, I suspect. It's really just the, the future investment return. We'd, we'd hope always that the fund actually does achieve more than and that number over time, that would be the, the hope that you would do, because that's a more that's a prudent assumption. The rest of the assumptions we set are best estimate, so they're more like 50-50. So the prudence of the evaluation which you're required to do as a fund is built into this number. The rest of the assumptions are trying to be best estimates as, as far as possible. Okay. Next sorry, yes. Yeah, thank you. It's just you see how it's a proposed assumption change to move from one point six to one point eight. Is that something that you proposed and is that you determine or does the pension subcommittee have to kind of say yeah go for it yeah i put proposed because we haven't finalized the results and, and we've taken this proposal to officers and they've agreed you know following discussions with them to move up to 1.8 uh and I, I guess today is more i kind of it's proposed to ratify that assumption and allowing us to proceed and do the calculations and do the employer results so uh, I, I guess it's you know taking it to the committee and You've just been comfortable with that assumption, and if you need any further information about it, it can be provided if you need it. So, could I ask what the uh, what the guilt yield was at the last evaluation? Yes, I'll come on to that. There's a slide in a minute. Three, uh, I think it's come down quite a bit. Have you got that? It's in a later slide. Uh, three and a half it was, so it's come down a fair whack. 
on your point there. I think what now that you've uh, answered that, I'm just not sure if we're actually making a decision or just sort of nodding our head at that. Right. I, I, certainly the. <laughs> The funds I work for, funds do different things. Some committees are very straight, you know, we, we want the final decision of this and some allow delegated decision to the officers. I don't know, Gemma, if you're comfortable, because I was certainly the officers and the actuary are happy with this assumption of the proposal. And I've put proposal because it's, we haven't yet finalised the report, so it's proposed. So, I, I, you know, uh, depends whether or not you, you know how much detail you want on this. Uh, Can I just then ask for advice saying, well, are you proposing it to us? And are we to sort of to go aye? Or uh, are you proposing it just generally? No, or is it, so it's proposed to the committee that this is what we recommend or propose. I could call it a recommendation if you like. Uh, so it's, it's, that's what we, unless you've got any issues with it or you need further information, that's what we propose to do for this valuation. Uh, I'll just ask Gemma to. Sorry. Uh, so, as as Richard said, the, there have been quite lengthy discussions with myself, with uh, with Andy, and with uh, Gillian Ross as the, as the interim head of finance on the proposal. Um, the, the key thing is that we do take the advice from Hymans. They recommend a rate that is appropriate. This is in line with what other um, authorities are doing, and it does continue to be prudent for the subcommittee. It is to to note the contents of this report and. Uh, if you do have any concerns that that rate maybe is not a, a prudent one, then we, we would look to go back on that. But as officers, we're satisfied from the discussions with Hymans that this does represent a, a reasonable and prudent rate uh, for, for the current uh, upcoming three-year period. No, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of comfortable with, obviously, the, what you're saying there. It's more just in terms of the governance of the decision-making of the pension subcommittee, and maybe it might welcome input from the governance officer just on this. It's really just, it's a proposal, it's contained within the report. Professionally, everybody's satisfied with it. I think as members, though, we're maybe, well, I'm certainly curious as to, should I be playing an active decision-making role to agree this proposal? Or is it just to note that this has been agreed by professionals and we're overseeing that, if you like, uh, but we don't actually have to make a decision on it, if that makes any sense. <laughs> Yes, um, I would I would agree with the advice that Gemma has just given, and again the advice from Hyman Robertson and the, the pension subcommittee are you're ratifying this. You do have the option to go back or raise raise concerns. So, so within the report as presented, we are are we noting or ratifying? From my point of view, it is to note that that this is the the recommended discount rate. Stephen, would you be happier if instead we the recommendation is to you know agree to to note the present note the present. Right. Note the presentation and the report, and then to agree the strategy that's been outlined. Would that make you happier? My happiness isn't that important, but uh, 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 it was more just for clarity, just for members who may not all be as familiar with um, the processes. So if we're just being asked to note the presentation, that's fine. We can note and be informed by it. If governance is happy that the advice that's been given is fine, then I I'm sort of thinking, are we being asked to ratify? Because that sounds like something important as opposed to just noting, which is like, aye, we've seen it. So um, it's really just, that was all the clarity I was looking for, so. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, you, you mentioned that the guilt yield some years ago was 3.5%, I think you said. Three years ago, yes. Three years ago. Uh, what was the AOA at that point? It was 1.6%. Right, so that's... So just moved 2.2 of a percent. C correct, yeah. And that's, that's, trying, that's a reflection of what, what, what we and the fund think is a reasonable outperformance above bonds, because you don't hold, you hold some bonds, but you hold equities and growth assets. So that's a prudent outlook on what that growth might be across your full portfolio. And there's, there's over a two-thirds likelihood based on modelling analysis we did, but the 1.8%. Uh, it's, a, it's about a 70-odd percent, just above 70% likelihood of that, keeping the fund safe. So it felt like a, 
a reasonable assumption to make. Uh, that's based on the current investment strategy. One thing we did think about when we discussed with officers is the fact that over time, your fund, like all LGPS funds, will mature over time. And, you know, it just naturally will happen already. About half of the LGPS funds are in negative cash flow territory. In other words, they're paying out more benefits than they're taking in, in contributions. So your current investment strategy is quite highly in growth, and that's fine. Uh, but I suspect over time, you know, and it might be 15, 20, 30, you, you'll, you'll de-risk gradually, I would suspect, over time and move towards less growth to try and better match for liabilities, the more mature liabilities. So you kind of, if you build that into it as well, 1.8, you could have gone slightly higher maybe. Uh, but I, th I think from a sort of, you know, trying to reflect the fact the strategy might change over time as well. And we are looking at a fairly long time horizon. 1.8 felt like a decent adjustment to this valuation up the way to reflect uh, that, that uh, estimate, to reflect the outlook. David, do you have a question? <laughs> so, sorry, because the, the, the first point was on the, the governance issue, and if I take you back to the first slide, it, it talks about the progress of the valuation. Yes. And it's quite clear that at the moment we're not actually required to agree anything. Um, it's not until quarter one that the, the pension subcommittee will be asked to, to look at the final results of the evaluation and actually make a, yeah. a consideration. So I don't think we've been asked to do anything today in terms of agreement or decision yeah, yeah. making. So from a point of view, I think, I think we, sorry, the work proposed is simply because we, nothing's final until the end of the evaluation process. And, but, but to start doing the employer numbers, we you know we want to check the committee. I guess is comfortable with the proposal yeah. here. Uh, right. You're right. Actually, we can still listen. We can still change these numbers and change you know change your rates all the way up to the end of March. But it's just for practical purposes, trying to sort of get your again, you're comfortable with what the approach taken and to right. make sure you're aware of what's going on. I suppose. But yeah. so so it's so probably is for noting. Technically, it's for noting all the way up until you finally we all ratify it and see here's the final set that goes in the report. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ian? I, I, I did have a second question, sorry. To, to go back to the current slide, um, <laughs> uh, it's just a follow-up question to the one asked earlier, actually. It was to ask what the discount rate was at the last evaluation. Yes, well, that's 5.1, uh, 5.1. It's on a later slide, but it's 5.1. Okay, Ian? I just, yeah, I just think... Come back to the governance thing. I don't think there is, because if you look at the purpose of the report, it's an interim report, and it's telling us what the valuations are. It's for noting, so I'd imagine we'll get something later on that we maybe would ratify. There's, a, there's an obvious question for me, but I'll wait and see if you come out, obviously, about the, the liabilities and the assets that we have within the fund and how, it's got to, how we've got to secure that for the long term. But I'll come back to that later on, Chairman, if, if it's no answer to the slides. I think I had some questions about that as well, but I see you looking through the slides when we come back to it. Matthew? Sorry, you may answer this in a later slide, but how accurate was the 1.6% AOA previously? Hmm. I don't have the stats to hand. I suspect that uh, if we go, I mean, I'm thinking back, the problem with the AOA is a kind of very long term thing, looking at the long term, and I don't have the stats right in front of me, what the fund's actually done over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Uh, I'm thinking back to valuations I've been involved in. Uh, so this valuation, the AOA has been, the AOA, that long-term assumption has been much less than what's actually happened over the last three years. And a lot of that's been driven by you know, currency movements, that sort of thing as well. So there's different as you're investing globally. Uh, but then I'm thinking back to 2011 valuation, which included the credit crunch, and of course the AOA was, you know, it was a big negative figure appearing there. So, so the AOA is a trend, it's a long-term average, if you like. So it's... I'm sorry, I don't have the stats going back 30, 40, 50 years as to how accurate that would have been. But what I would say is that interest rates and growth has come down, you know, since the 80s and 90s when you saw the real, the, the huge growth, some, some, some of which was dot-com bubbles and the likes, but there was a big kind of uh, bull run, you know, during the 80s and 90s. Uh, quite happy with that. Can I just add, just roughly, do you know how how much it could fluctuate? I know that's a very hard question, and I appreciate you don't have the figures, but it, just to give us some idea on noting this point on the increase, 0.2% of of the assumption could be a huge amount of money. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So bull and bear markets, are we talking tens of percent? I mean, if you, well, if you look at it just the last three years alone, uh, the fund returned 35, uh, it's in the slide, I think, uh, 35% versus an expectation of 15. So there you go, you want to watch over the last three years. Now, the next few years might reverse, or it might be positive again. Uh, so it, it can be very volatile. And what, what I think it's fair to say in the last decade or so, it's been much more volatile compared to the 80s and 90s, and even part of the 2000s. It was much smoother. It was kind of more predictable. It doesn't feel like that's the case anymore. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty out there. So it's, it's a hard question. And I appreciate, you know, it's not a kind of immediate answer to that. But it is, I think it's much more, it can be big swings, I would say. And there's a chart later on we'll show you the impact of the last three years in terms of what it makes to the, and it's, it's big money, you know, it's tens of millions of pounds. Yeah. Jim? Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Well, I think if anyone's, if we're finished with questions, we'll let um, the, the presentation carry on. And I think that, you know, consensus does seem to be that we're quite happy with the recommendations. But if anyone isn't, they can make themselves known when we come to the recommendations. Okay, I'll ask you to ca- Okay. Okay. Uh, the next big assumption we talked about salary, salary growth earlier on, uh, and the fact that there are still a lot of benefits in the scheme linked to final salary. Despite this move to care in 2015, the bulk of the liabilities are linked to final salary, certainly in the active members, obviously, who are still earning. So because we moved to care in 2015, there's a runoff now happening in the scheme. So as people leave, either leave active service and you know move to another employer or retire, uh, most people lose the link to final salary. It gets crystallized at the date of the exit, and you either get a deferred benefit or a retirement benefit, it gets paid out. And so there's a very there's a, quite a sharp runoff happening in these final salary link liabilities. And what this chart's trying to show is just how quickly that runoff happens. And if you can see it, it's maybe easier to see in your handout possibly. About fifty percent of those liabilities will be discharged, in other words, come into payment or otherwise by twenty twenty. So actually, there's a lot of liabilities in final salary link, but they are, tend to be dominated by people who are quite close to retirement, a lot of service and fairly large salaries compared to the average. So there's a sharp runoff. So that, that's, that's, that's interesting from the point of view of that. That runoff, the duration of those salary link liabilities is reducing very much over time. So this will become a less significant assumption over time. Still significant, but this valuation will become less so over time. Uh, so what we've done at this valuation to set the assumption we allowed for this runoff and the period over which it takes place, uh, and we've also we've also thought of other things, and in particular, of course, public sector pay restraint, and uh, that's a big issue. So salary growth has remained muted over the last three years, as was the case actually at the last valuation. The experience then was that uh, pay restraint has been muted. Uh, there was an announcement, both I think at the Scottish government level and at UK government level, about linking, you know, ditching the kind of previous one percent restriction and linking it some way to cost of living. So I think there are there are signs that there might be some pay or higher pay growth going forward a bit compared to that very low level we've seen over the last kind of six seven years. So what what, what we did at the twenty fourteen valuation. Uh, and even at the end of 2014 assumption, I think, was lower than the 2011 assumption. At 2014, the assumption was set at uh, RPI plus 1%. So uh, we we felt that this valuation, that felt too high, given what's happening, given what we know is out there, and given this runoff of liabilities on the last chart there. Uh, so we looked at various options and scenarios with the officers about where this might go in the future. Uh, and what we came up with is an assumption of RPI less 0.2%, so quite a reduction. And that was based on assuming that pay growth to 2020 might be of the order of about 2% for people-ish, which is roughly cost of living. 
And then it might go to a, a bit of a higher level thereafter. I think the higher level was RPI plus a half, I think we used for the longer term. So we kind of came up with a blended rate between 2% for the short term and RPI plus 0.2 for those liabilities being discharged over the longer term. So you end up with a blended rate of RPI less 0.2 when you convert it into one single rate. So that's quite a reduction at this valuation. We do feel it's justifiable. It feels like that pay growth assumption is too high. Uh, so what we are proposing or for noting at this meeting uh, is a, a reduction from RPI plus 1 to RPI minus 0.2. These days in the public sector, in particular, I think CPI is the one that a lot of people talk about. We use RPI because that's what bond, you know, the bond market's dominated by RPI instruments, but uh, CPI is in more common parlance, so that would be CPI plus 0.8, if you like, or RPI minus 0.2. So that's for that's what we are intend to do at this valuation. A wee bit concerned about the the previous slide then, given what you've just said about the salary growth assumption, because there's a very, very steep fall there over a very short number of years. Yes. And then yes. it levels out after that. And it's just that steep fall um, initially that you've assumed. Yeah. It, 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 that seems really... It, 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 seems, it seems steep. What, what's happening in this runoff thing is that so this, is, this, is a, this is liability, so it's not number of members. If you converted that to number of members, the shortfall of wouldn't be anywhere near as sharp. And the reason is that the, the liabilities as a value are dominated by older people with generally larger salaries. So, and, uh, so a lot of these people are due to retire quite soon. So in fact, those liabilities, so the number of people would be very much different. You would get a much flatter runoff over time. But when you look at liabilities, which is what we do at the valuation, it's more about the, the value. Of, the, of you know the actual liabilities rather than a number of members, you get quite a sharp one. So you, you know it's, a, it's perhaps surprising, but it is. We're seeing that across a lot of funds. It's quite common. It's really dominated by the older people who are close to retirement, with lots of service. So they've got big liabilities. Okay. Any more on that assumption? Is that is that okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And well, we talked about pension increases and virtually all the benefits in the fund are linked to consumer prices, inflation, CPI. Uh, there is no sort of, so the Bank of England have got a target that's 2% and I think we know at the moment that, you know, that target's been exceeded. Inflation's pretty high, current inflation. What we are trying to do is set inflation over a longer term again, so trying to estimate what we think inflation might be over a longer term. Again, the bond markets, if you, if you look at the difference between index linked and nominal gilts, fixed interest index linked, that in theory should be what the future expectation of RPI is, because government bonds pay out, uh, are linked to RPI. There's a gap between RPI and CPI for technical reasons. There always will be a gap. They call it the formal effect. And there have been changes to that formal effect, this gap between RPI and CPI over the last three years quite technical changes around about the constituents of the indices, things like footwear and clothing. Uh, so that gap has, has generally increased over the last three years from an average of about 0.8% of the last valuation to about 1% now. So what we're suggesting at this valuation is to increase that gap in line with that evidence. So move it up 0.2 from 0.8 to 2014 to 1% now. So that gap, so you take the RPI assumption and you knock off 1% to come up with the pension increase assumption of CPI. So that's, uh, that's evident, based, based on that evidence. Uh, we think that's, that's quite, quite consistent with what government have done. They used to be a lot higher. They are 1.4. They brought it down to 1. So everybody seems to be agreeing that 1's a, a decent estimate. Okay. And I think... Right, we'll come on to our favourite topic, how long people live. Uh, so, well, we've talked a little bit about this. This is, this is quite interesting. It's a big area, a lot of statistics, and I can only really cover a lot of this today. Um, I, th I think you probably all know that longevity is very much dependent on a whole host of factors, and it's a hard one to get right. Uh, we, we split it into two assumptions, if you like. We have what we call the baseline longevity assumption, the baseline life expectancy. 
And that's very evidential. That's just based on hard facts. That's based on the rates at which people are currently dying, based on data, pooled data from across lots and lots of different pension funds. So that's quite just hard fact based. Uh, and then you've got the longevity improvements assumption, and that's a more subjective one. That's about, well, currently people are dying at a certain rate, but actually in 20 years, 30 years, what rate will we be dying at? Because people are generally have been living longer, certainly over the last few decades, the golden generation, we call them. Uh, so we, we kind of set two. This is looking at, first of all, what we call this baseline longevity. And I'll show you shortly. We use a, a sister company of Hyman's called uh, Club Vita, which pulls data across the LGPS and private sector funds. And we consistently see big differences for three key reasons shown in the slide here. So what we've got here on the left-hand side, we've got uh, probably a Glaswegian, but this guy uh, eats a lot of chips, <laughs> like chips. Uh, he's not very fit. He's, he's, a bit, he's not very unwell. So you've got that, that kind of extreme. So you've got a chap here who has got poor ill health. He actually doesn't. He's a manual worker, possibly, or unskilled worker. He's got low affluence levels, and he has an unhealthy lifestyle. So we'll call this guy on the left-hand side. On the other side, you've got someone who's got, who lives uh, a much healthier lifestyle. Uh, he's in postcode can tell you a lot actually about lifestyle factors. And we do use sorry we use other analysis such as the Tesco Club Card. Twenty five million people in the UK have got a club card, and you'll be amazed what you can find out about people's lifestyles through what they buy. It's a big determinant. You can find out quite a lot of information. This chap's got a high level of affluence compared to the, the average, and he's. <laughs> He's retiring uh, on normal health retirement, this chap. And you'll see there is a gap between these two people, these two extremes of about 10 years here. And you can break that 10 years down roughly into lifestyle factors of about four and a half years. Affluence of about three years. And of course, the two are correlated. You know, generally affluence and postcode and lifestyle tend to have a correlation there. But you can split it down over that 10 years. And then Generally, people who retire on ill health grounds, they have a shorter life expectancy of about two and a half years. So you can split that down. We do, we do that. For, we, have, we set an assumption for every employer and every member in the fund. So what you'll find if you've got an employer with a lot of the guys on the left, their pension costs will be lower and they'll be charged less less through the contribution rate than an employer that employs a lot of the guys on the right. There, a lot of these people. So we use this company called Club Vita to do the analysis, and they generally get the, the baseline is the longevity is generally pretty close to expectations. That's what we do there. Uh, just to give you a flavor of this, and, and I appreciate a couple of people in the room were at the LGC conference. <laughs> uh, and unfortunately, at the LGC conference in Edinburgh recently, I put up a map of Scotland. And I was trying to make the point between the central belt being very different from the rest of Scotland, but the person who <laughs> the formatting cropped off Dumfries and the border. So my sincere report, I almost cropped off Glasgow, uh, but it was meant to be a map of Scotland and the Western Isles and everything. So, you know, so that's, uh, my apologies for that. But this is very clearly a, you know, Dumfries and the surrounding area. Uh, this is what we call heat map. Um, and blue, this is not political. Blue is high life expectancy, and uh, red is areas of low life expectancy compared to the average based on postcode analysis. And you'll see you've got some pockets of red, uh, and you've got quite a lot of blue as well. And, and your, your membership, of course, will be, I'm assuming a lot of them will be still based around about this area. But you'll have people who have pensioners who have probably are abroad or elsewhere, and we do allow for all that, believe it or not. We do allow for where they stay and what we're currently as well as we can do. Uh, if you look at the map, and again, you know, people at LGC might remember, if you look at Glasgow, it's very red. In Glasgow in particular, it's very red, and it can make a big difference. So Strathclyde Pension Fund will generally have lower life expectancy on average than, than you will, and indeed Lovian Pension Fund will as well. Uh, Ember is not that different to Glasgow, believe it or not. Uh, a lot of people think it is, but it's not that different on based on postcode analysis. So. That's what we do for this baseline thing. And the big question, I suppose, our question is this future improvement uh, assumption. What we did, you probably, if you, if, you read the, if you read the news, there's always headlines about 
life expectancy improving or deteriorating. And you might have noticed in recent years there's been maybe a bit of a wobble in improvements. So during the 2000s, we saw quite a steady growth in life expectancy. It was about two, two and a half years over that full decade. So big, big spurt, if you like, in life expectancy rates. There's been more of a wobble in the last five to six years. And there's all sorts of theories about why that wobble's taking place. Some of it was due to things like a flu vaccine being wrong. So with the 2014-15 winter, the wrong vaccine was given out. So a lot of pensioners died during that winter. So you get the spike in 2014-15, but that, that can happen. So things like that can happen. We personally think that that level of improvements, that this golden cohort from the post-war generation, that kind of improvement rate has peaked. And we think, we think improvements will still continue, but at a lower pace. What we've done to allow for this wobble I mentioned is to bring down the improvement assumption a little bit of this valuation. So we, we assumed about one year per decade going forward. Uh, at the last valuation, we're assuming slightly less than that. Not much less, but slightly less to allow for this wobble. And it's something we need to just look at every three years and check as to whether that's reasonable or not. And don't worry about the bottom comment. The CMI, that's a, an actuarial group, which uh, they, they do lots of modelling and produce tables of stuff which aren't that exciting, but they, we're going to their current version because that's a more a better data set, effectively. So that's, uh, so that's longevity in a nutshell. Uh, so not a lot of change, frankly, to that. The, the, the impact of that financially isn't big on the pension fund. It doesn't change the liabilities a lot at all. Okay, and this is just, before I pass back to Alan, uh, this is just a summary of all this stuff we talk, I talked about there. So you'll see we mentioned that three point that five point one percent a moment ago. Somebody asked a question about it. So that that so the discount rate has come down quite a bit despite the change in that asset outperformance assumption. Uh, RPI, sorry, RPI and CPI expectations are uh, generally not a wee bit lower. This this valuation RPI is about the same at three three point four percent. But that gap's been increased to one, so you get a 2.4% assumption for CPI going forward. And the salary increases I mentioned earlier, it's RPI minus 0.2 we're suggesting here. So that gives you a 3.2% assumption compared to quite a quite a, a, a bigger one at the last valuation. And all longevity, that's just what I talked about. There's not a lot of change uh, there at all. So that, that's all the assumptions. Uh, and I'll pass back to Alan now. Thanks, Richard. So, in a couple of slides' time, I'll just come on to show you what the actual impact is in the liabilities and the funding position of all these assumptions. So I know when you've got the whole picture, it'll make a bit more sense how these change and how that affects. But it's important to note that each valuation is just a snapshot of one day in the pension fund. So we get data as at the 31st of March 2017. This Slides just a summary of how the memberships changed over that three year period, but in reality it's probably changing on a, on a daily basis. But you can see overall the membership has increased by about 15%. So the blue bar at the bottom, if you like, 2014 that represents active members. So there were 3,761 actives. 2017 that's gone up by about 700 odd. Within that, that's not just an extra 700 active members. There's people that have left to become deferred members. There's people that have retired. So there's more. There's a bigger change in active membership. And this is just to highlight the point that it's not just numbers of members. It's what's happening beneath that. There's changes in membership. People are changing status. There might be people that had left the council, have come back to work to the council, and they're now active again. So it's just to highlight the fact that the membership of the fund's always changing. And we just look at that every three years, take a snapshot of those people and value them. The key thing to note is that overall the membership's increased. So this is probably alongside the, the contribution rates, which is probably the most important output of the valuation. This is just a summary of the balance sheet, if you like, of the pension fund at 31st of March 2017. So total liability is 913 million. And that's just an aggregate of all the individual members in the fund based on that chart I showed you before how their benefits are, are built up. And that's a liability in today's terms. We've broken it out into employees. So that's current member, members who are currently working for an employer in the fund. 
deferred pensioners or people who have accrued liabilities in the fund have worked for a fund employer but currently don't but they're not yet drawing a pension so they've earned benefits that aren't being paid out yet they're just sort of being stored at the side until they hit their retirement age and then those benefits will start to be paid pensioners are currently in receipt of their pensions you can't just compare these like for like because the next chart will show you there's loads of things that happen between valuations so we've changed assumptions between valuations as Richard's just spoken about so you can't say we've gone from employee liabilities being 335 they're now 387 that's just a big increase there's reasons for that increase and the main one is the change in assumptions but overall the sort of key statistic from this chart if you like or two the deficit in 2014 was 84 million the deficit now is 76 million so there's been a slight reduction in the deficit and the funding levels changed from 88% to 92%. So the assets held are 92% of the total liabilities in the fund. You might think, how's the funding level gone up 4% but there's only an 8 million drop in the deficit? It's just because both the assets and liabilities have grown and the deficit's the difference between those numbers. So although the, in percentage terms, the assets have caught up with the liabilities more when you take the difference between those numbers, that's what the deficit is. So what's the experience been? We touched on, there was a question earlier about how the discount rate is compared to the fund returns, if you like. So this top, um, top table shows what the investment experience has been. So over the three years, we expected 16.1%, which is just the previous discount rate assumption of 5.1% compounded up over three years gives you that 16.1 percent the fund has actually returned 35 percent so more than twice that but as Richard said the discount rate you might look at that and you got that wildly wrong but the discount rate is a long-term assumption that's the first thing to bear in mind and also within that 35 percent if you look at it on an annual basis one year you might have had 20 percent another year you might have had two percent so there's huge fluctuations within those actual returns the discount rate is a long 20 year sort of term assumption. But that has had a positive impact, the fact that the fund has returned more than we expected. Your assets have grown more than we expected, which is one of the key things that's chipped away at that deficit and improved the funding level. Also this change in gilt yields, which informs the discount rate. So the last valuation gilt yield was 3.5%, which gave you your discount rate of 5.1%. This year, it's 1.7%, leading to a discount rate of 3.5%. That is at a negative impact, so that's effectively increased the liabilities and cost the fund, because the expected return is less. So when we bring the liabilities back in to today's money, it's a higher number. And then there's also experience what we call experience from a sort of membership level. So that's how has our assumption compared with what's actually happened over the last three years. And the bottom table here just breaks that down slightly. So the first one's early leavers. That's people leaving active status, so becoming deferred before or before retirement, how that compares to what we expected. There have been fewer people have left active status and become deferred than we expected. And that has a negative impact for the fund. Because when you leave active status, you lose your final salary link and all your benefits are just revalued in line with CPI, which is less than the salary assumption. So when you leave active status, your sort of annual increases in your benefits are less than they would be if you were still active and retain the salary link. So that costs the fund. If there are fewer people losing that salary link does that make sense ill health again they're relatively small numbers here so we expected 75 people to retire in ill health we've actually had 67 so there's been a few less than expected that's again that's a, a benefit to the fund because if you get an ill health retirement pension your pension can be enhanced and it's also paid earlier than we'd expect so that costs the fund money if there are fewer than expected the cost, the extra cost to the fund isn't as high as we'd expect. 
similarly, this, the actual salary increases that we've seen have been lower than was expected last time. That 5.1% under the expected column, that includes promotional increases. So the salary increase assumption that Richard's spoken about, that doesn't include any promotional element. If you've got sort of increments in your job, that's a, that's a separate assumption. Here, when we look at what the experience has been, including the promotional aspect, in the last valuation we assumed 5.1%. When we drill down and look at people that have been here for the full three-year period, in reality, the average increase has been 2.7%. And again, that's a benefit to the fund. That's a positive impact. Salary increases have been lower than expected. So benefits haven't increased by as much. And again, post-retirement experience, we expected 2.7% to be CPI over the three-year period. In reality, the pension increases that have been applied in line with CPI by the government have been 0.7% on average. And the final one, pension ceasing, that's just so we don't measure numbers of people that die in the analysis because you could have a thousand people die all with a pension of a pound or you could have one person that dies with a pension of 10,000 pounds. So we look at the actual amount of pension ceasing because that's what sort of correlates with liabilities. And there's been slightly more pension ceasing than we would than we had expected. So that again has had a positive impact for the fund. And just bringing all that together, this hopefully gives you the question was asked earlier: what would the sort of financial impact be of all these things? This chart hopefully shows you that. So I'll just go through it quickly. Um, Top bar is your deficit at the last valuation. So in 2014, that was the deficit of the fund. Everything underneath that is just the impact of different items of experience, if you like, different things that have happened, what the financial impact of those is. So if you think of that deficit as being like a debt, interest gets applied to that debt, interest applied to the deficit, that interest cost is just based on the, the discount rate. So it's effectively treating the discount rate as an interest rate on your deficit. So that's what that £13 million pounds is. The investment returns being greater than expected. So that's your assets having growing more, grown more than we expected. That's benefited the fund by £107 million, which is great news. Contributions greater than the cost of accrual. Now this is just acknowledging the fact that the fund was in deficit. So employers are paying more than just the cost of benefits being accrued. So it might be that 20% of the employer contribution rate goes to accrual of benefits, so benefits over the next year. But there's an element paying back that deficit as well. So the employers are paying more, slightly more, than the actual benefits being accrued in future. They're chipping away at the deficit as well. So that's what that four million is. Membership experience, so that captures things like the salary increases, the pension increases, just underlying changes in membership. Um, that's benefited the fund by 54 million. And if you look back at the last slide, it's things like salary increases being less than expected, pension increases being less than expected, fewer um, ill healths, which feed into the, the change in demographic assumptions as well. So we look at the experience over the period, how have our assumptions borne out? So we saw fewer ill health than expected, fewer people withdrawing than expected. So we've tweaked our assumptions slightly, not to absolutely mirror that, but just to reflect that. So we've probably reduced the withdrawal assumption, which means we expect slightly fewer people will leave active status before their retirement age. And that's got a slight cost associated with it. So the cost of that is eight million. And as Richard was talking about in the when he was speaking about longevity assumption, how long we expect people to live, this sort of reflects the fact that things have been fairly steady. So changing baseline mortality, that's the thing that Club Vita informed. There's been a ten million saving. So based on the experience of the fund, people are maybe dying slightly earlier than had been expected previously. So we've updated the assumption and that's saved the fund £10 million, if you like. And similarly, the change in improvements has had an effect of £4 million. The key sort of negative here is the change in financial assumptions. So that negative £156 million. So 
Just the change in assumptions over the three year period has been a cost of 156 million. There's red sort of box there breaks that down. So the discount rate changing, so it's gone from 5.1% to 3.5%, driven mainly by the fallen in gilts. That's cost. The cost of that has been 235 million. So if that's the only assumption you'd changed, everything else had been exactly the same, your deficit would have increased by 235 million. But we said we've reduced the salary increase assumption to better reflect experience and what we think will happen in future. That's led to a saving of 46 million. And again, pension increases, so the change in CPI from 0.8 to 1%, being the difference between RPI and CPI, that's led to a saving of about 33 million. So when you combine those three factors, you get an overall change from the change in financial assumptions of 156 million. And other experience is just things that we, without drilling down in even more detail, that we're not explaining by everything else. It's almost a balancing item. I feel like that could be slight changes in data. There's various things can feed into that. And then that gets you to your overall position of a deficit of 76 million. And that hopefully sort of brings everything together and gives a bit of context to the changes and assumptions. Does anyone get any questions on that? Is that okay? Great. Pass you back to Richard now. We'll talk a bit more about what's still to be done in the valuation. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so we're just looking ahead now of what needs to be done uh, uh, as we go towards the end of the valuation process and towards the end of March uh, next year, which isn't far away. So just to remind you of that chart we showed earlier on, so we're here in the November. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about this to be stabilization, stabilization modeling to do with uh, stabilizing contribution rates for the council. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the next step is to produce employer results. So drill down to individual fund positions for all the, the 25 employers in the pension fund. We'll discuss them with officers in December. Uh, we'll come up with a set of results for employers and a schedule, and that will, will be issued to all the employers in uh, December or, or January. There's a requirement under the regulations to, well, we talked about this funding strategy statement earlier on, a uh, requirement is to consult with employers, so the fund must do that under under legislation, so we will get a copy of that as well. And then during that quarter, the next quarter, we need to finalise the rates, take on board any comments, see what comments we get from employers about the rates, and then uh, sign off the employer results, the assumptions, the funding strategy statement. Uh, and that's, I think, when you know the committee can, you know, has to sort of that, that ratification process there and approval. Uh, I'll be built into that. And then, as I say, the final drop dead date here, we must adhere to is to sign off the report uh, at the end of March 2018. That must be signed off. There's something called a rates and adjustment certificate at the back of the report. And that's just a list of all the employers in the fund and their new contribution rates. So that's right at the back of the report. That's a crucial part of that document. And we must do that. Again, that's the law. You must create this, this RNA certificate, as they call it, and update it every three years. So this is what it looks like. So you'll see this is a funny strategy statement is a, an awesome read. <laughs> it's a, it basically captures all the funding strategy st decisions, the assumptions. It complies with the code of practice or the new code of, code of practice and guidance they issued since 2014. So it complies with that as well. So it's a big document. There's already one in place, but that's reviewed as part of evaluation and consulted with employers. So we're working on a draft at the moment, encapsulating a lot of the stuff we've talked about today, and that will be issued along with the employer results. So that on the right-hand side, each employer uh, can get a result schedule that details the data being used in their calculations. It shows their funding position, it also shows the assumptions, and most importantly, at the back of that schedule, it will show their new contribution rates that are being proposed at this valuation. So that's the output that employers get. This is just a, it's a bit of a technical thing, but uh, the, the regulations were changed to talk about primary and secondary contribution rates. So it doesn't really affect any of the work that we do. It's just the language, the terminology. So the primary rate, we have to call it, that's the cost of future service benefits. 
So the contribution rate consists of two things generally. The cost of the future service benefits for those who are active in the pension fund. People accruing after evaluation date you need to come as that 49th thing that you mentioned, the care benefits. That's got cost. We call that primary rate now. And of course we adjust we adjust that rate to get to make sure that employer will be fully funded over whatever time horizon they are likely to be in the pension fund. And we call that the secondary rate. So you've got primary and secondary rate. It's just different language. It doesn't make any particular difference to the way in which we do the evaluation. It's just we have to use this language now. So that rates and adjustment certificate will contain that language. But it's nothing to really be concerned about. It's just a change. And I was talking to the academy down in England, and they said, secondary rate, is that one just for us? <laughs> I said, no, 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 nothing to do with secondary schools. So uh, primary and secondary. OK. Uh, this is a badly photoshopped picture, but we, we, when, when we look at the, the employer results, we're kind of juggling lots of different things. Uh, and one of, the, one of the key ones, actually, is whether an employer is open or closed. So a lot of employers are open to new entrants. They're going to be in for the long term, but some are closed bodies. Uh, and they, could, they will exit eventually once the last active member leaves that employer. It triggers a cessation debt or cessation valuation, should I say, under the regulations. So we have to carry out a calculation to see whether or not they're in deficit. And so for those employers, we need to make sure we're targeting that debt over an appropriate time horizon. Okay, so that's one of the key ones there. And we look at lots of different ones. Clearly, the funding level, we've talked about a 92% funding level across the fund on average. Some are below and some are above. Uh, so we need to allow for that. And that time horizon is very much linked to uh, the open or closed things. So the council, for example, I think it's 20 years we use for the council. That's the longest recovery period we have for recovering deficit. But some have got a lower period depending on their time horizon, and that's dependent on their membership profile in the fund. So we juggle lots of different things at the valuation to set employer rates. And we'll, again, we'll come back to that when we, we do, when we report on the employer results, we can look at that in a bit more detail. I mentioned that this thing, the state stabilised rate. Um, the, the council is in a quite a luxurious position in many respects. They're, they're, the, they're a long-term employer, first of all, in the pension fund. They're a scheduled body under the regulations, so they must admit new entrants. They must, they must come into the pension fund. They don't have a choice in that respect. What that means, of course, they are in for a long-term council. Not all employers are in that position. And not only that, they're a tax-raising body. They've got tax-raising power, power, so they're the most secure employer in the fund. And so for those two reasons, uh, what, what, what we do for them, and also, sorry, they're the most dominant employer, and by that I mean they hold most of the liabilities in the fund. Sorry, I don't have a percentage, but it's 80, 90, 90%, so 90% or so of the fund is the council. So a lot, a lot of other bodies, but only 10% of the liabilities, so they're financially significant. For them, uh, at the last valuation, uh, we set up a contribution stability mechanism. And really, the, the aim behind that is to steer contribution rate for a council, because we know they are good for their money and they're in for the longer term, is to steer their rate in a less volatile way than otherwise they might. They might be more volatile if we didn't set up this mechanism. So it's allow a bit of stability for that particular employer in the fund. We do asset liability modeling, so we do projections of the future, and we check whether that stabilisation mechanism keeps the fund safe or not. So whether that, that, that kind of two-thirds thing I talked about earlier, that, that chance of being fully funded over the longer term. We, we, run, we run a number of contribution rate scenarios, a number of mechanisms through the modelling, and we, we came up with one at 2014, which uh, stabilises at plus or, yeah, 21 and a half, plus or minus a half percent. So at the moment, the stability mechanism built into the funding strategy statement which is in the 2014 version that we're reviewing currently, the rate fluctuates each year by no more than half percent of pay. So if it's currently 21.5 percent of pay, then most it could go up to in the next three years would be plus a half, plus a half, plus a half. So we're looking at that modelling. We're just in the throes of doing that for this valuation to see how that rate looks and how those parameters work at this valuation. Uh, so we'll report back on that soon. So that, that's the theory, is to try and steer them through the, the peaks and the troughs of the pension fund over time, all that uncertainty we talked about. I think, I think this is possibly the final slide, actually. Uh, 
I haven't talked, I haven't mentioned at all something called Section 13 that you might have heard of, uh, Section 13 valuation. Uh, that's a new thing, which wasn't in place at 2014. It came in under the Public Sector, so Public Services Pensions Act 2013. Uh, and that's a kind of overall scrutiny in the LGPS from central government. It applies to all the UK pension funds, Scotland, England, Wales. Uh, and what it does, it does a number of things actually, but one of the key things it does, it takes the, the, the results of evaluation from each LGPS fund in the country, and country of the UK, across the UK, and it converts the local funding results, so that set of assumptions discussed earlier, they kind of strip out the financial assumptions and they replace it with a single set of assumptions, they apply it to all the funds, so you do it on a like-for-like -like basis. Because, you know, a lot of funds will do different things with assumptions, so it's trying to get that, a similar set of assumptions applied to see where the funds are placed against each other. We don't just look at funding level, we look at lots of different measures such as implied investment returns, built in funding plans and so on. For today's purposes, I think it's probably enough to note, uh, if you look at this chart, each of these dots represents a fund, a LGPS fund, there's about 100 dots there across the UK. And I think you can see it better in your handout, maybe there are a few, I can see it better here, the kind of orange dots there are the Scottish LGPS funds. I'm hoping there are living in there. <laughs> there should be a living in there. Uh, and the one that's circled is the Freeze Pension Fund. And this was based on the 2014 valuation converted to these light for light assumptions. And you'll see, you see immediately there uh, that the ranking, the highest funding level, all the Scottish, well, first of all, all the Scottish funds are pretty highly ranked in the UK. But even the bottom fund there, it's still in the top 30 out of 100. And the Freeze is, you know, about what's that, about 18 or 19th. So that was at base at 2014. And I suppose in a nutshell, looking at this chart is the whole point of doing this is to check that this under section 13, that these funds are being run on a sustainable basis. So it's a treasury run thing. Treasury ultimately want to check that these funds won't run out of money. And I think it's safe to say that the freeze aren't in a position. There are some at the top right there that have got some challenges under this and they might well be, be, be questioned on the back of the Section 13 numbers at the 2016, but these are mostly English funds, they're all English funds in the top right. A lot of London boroughs as well. They'll probably be scrutinised quite thoroughly, I suspect, once the final version of this report comes out. These are based on kind of slightly out of date figures now, but there will be a 2017 Section 13 valuation across Scotland for all this funds, including your own. So it's just to flag up, you're in a good place, I think, so I wouldn't worry too much about that, but it is going on in the background and we'll have to report a Section 13 number to the Government Actuaries Department uh, just after the valuation ends. Uh, sorry, that's just uh, the usual stuff. Uh, so that was kind of uh, what we wanted to cover. I'm not appreciate we've been a few questions. Sorry, it's taking a bit longer, but you've asked me a few questions, but happy to take any more or, if, you know. Uh, Does anyone have any questions? No. Henry. Just looking at the graph there, the 11 dots representing Scotland, we're probably sitting ninth out of the 11th. And if we take the performance of the remaining uh, pension schemes in Scotland compared to the UK, they're all sitting in that bottom left-hand corner. So what funding level are they sitting at um, com compared to uh, Dumfries and Galloway? Yeah, so we are, I, I advise the Highland Pension Fund and Lothian Pension Fund. Uh, Lothian are certainly, they are, they're at year 92, they're, oh, quite Craig, I've got my spot here, I think they're 90, they're a bit higher, maybe 96, 97, based on initial results. Some of the funds haven't done the valuation yet or haven't reached this stage of producing results. Highland are one of the, they, they were better funded in Dumfries at the last valuation. Again, I'm talking about local assumptions, incidentally, albeit their assumptions aren't that dissimilar to Dumfries. Actually, in Scotland, the, the funds use the local assumptions at each fund aren't that different from one another. There's a bit more variety in England locally. So, 92, you, you, I suspect you'll still be kind of that sort of nine, eight, nine, maybe. A big, big part of this actually, uh, because the actuarial assumptions kind of get equalised on a like for like, a big part of this, whoops, is, uh, oops, sorry, 
Uh, a big part of this is the investment returns, and that's you know that affects the funding level clearly. Uh, the average across Scotland, I'm thinking the LGC conference, I did a slide in that, I think it was 38, 39% on average. Uh, but the, the fund that's really outperformed at this valuation is Lothian. Lothian had a really, really strong return, 51%. Very much, and they're an outlier. Most of them were around about 35 to 40 in Scotland. David? I was just going to ask if there was something that technically these better off funds in terms of this graph were doing that we are not doing. But if it's just if it's just the evaluations of the investments, then I suppose... The investments is a big driver, certainly. Uh, and of course, you know, different investment strategies, different managers and different reasons for holdings. Uh, there are some, there may be legacy things in here as well. So I'll give you an example. Uh, and this doesn't, I think, apply to any Scottish funds. Uh, the council tax issue in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, I think there was only England supplied to CLG in England. A lot of councils were struggling to collect council tax. The revenue wasn't coming in, so they agreed. I think it was a six-year time period, around about eight, early 80s. Funds were told if they wanted, they could adopt a funding target of 75% instead of 100% for the pension fund. Now, not all of the funds, it was just guidance. They said he could do it and we wouldn't bat an eyelid. Some funds took up that opportunity, some didn't. And in fact, the ones in the top right, a lot of them, they're still paying the price for that decision to go to 75. Basically, it led to contribution holidays for about three or six years. And so there's a big gap there, so they lost all the returns in the assets on that money. So that's one reason. Uh, early retirement and restructurings, quite often some funds have had a lot more early retirements happening, and maybe the strains weren't covered in full, and that's led to a deficit as well. So, so would it be possible to look back then at, 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 you know, over the historical data of things we've done compared to things these other groups have done, for example, pensions, holidays or something like that, to, to give us some guidance as to what, what is best not to do? A, uh, you, 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 I think analysis could be done. It may be a jolly expensive exercise because there's so many different root causes there. I suspect it would be, we can discuss it with officers further, uh, do you mean actually aside from investment returns, just why? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, there could be, yeah, there's quite, a, I suspect there's quite a few factors and part of the problem might be that we won't necessarily, I could, I don't know how much access we'd have to what other funds have done in terms of early retirements, in terms of decisions made on funding strategies and I, would I think it, it could, you could probably get a high level, but it might be a, quite a lot of work, quite expensive to do, but you know, if it's, if it's valuable, we could, could look at that. That was more just if something jumped out and sort of bit you in the nose and said, hey, that's something they've done in the past, they maybe should have I, 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 I could be wrong, but I, the, the, generally the key determinant is investment returns. Usually that's a major reason for funding levels being different or contribution holidays, uh, which none of the Scottish funds, as far as I'm aware, have ever done. They've never they've all used a 100% target. Uh, so. You know, it might even just be simple cases that there's different types of employers in there and different decisions were made, outsourcing were made. So it's, it's quite hard to pin it down to one particular reason outside investment returns. Uh, you'd, have to, you'd also have to go back a long time because the funds were set up in the 1920s, was it, I think? Something like that. A long time. It's looking at a hundred year history here of uh, build up. Are you quite happy there? Yep. Henry? Yeah, just a very quick one, Chair. Just out of curiosity, uh, what is the highest rank? Uh, who is it? What pension fund? Uh, 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 the Scottish one, you mean this Scottish dot here? Yeah. And like, I'm going to put my neck in the line, Strathclyde. I suspect it's Strathclyde. Interesting enough there, uh, what we talked earlier about Glaswegian life expectancy. So they, they, they are life expectancy assumption is quite low and Richard, Richard McIndoe, if you know Richard, he's got a theory that Glasgow's just a bit behind and will catch up. So in fact, <laughs> so we, we look at his improvements assumption, he thinks that the Glaswegians will eventually wake up and realise that you need to be a bit healthier in life to live longer. So he's, his improvements assumption is possibly a bit kind of heavier, i.e. He's putting a bit more side because he thinks that Glasgow will catch up with the rest eventually as cultural change. I don't know, but that's it's interesting. But I think it's Strathclyde who are the I think it's them, the orange dot on the left there. 
again, this, this is based in 2014, so, you know, uh, change again the order. Yeah. Is there any further questions? No, we're happy to move on to recommendations. So are we happy to note the presen presentation and the report from Hyman's Robertson? Ian? Thanks, you're happy to note. I just wonder in procedural wise, I mean, a really good presentation, better understanding when it comes to our financial strategy moving forward, because obviously that will help us as members, I think, influence our decisions there. When do we see that again? Uh, that that will be brought to you before the end of March uh, because it is part uh, of the uh, valuation as well and will need to be considered by the committee at that time. So I, I don't know the exact date of the, the next committee, but I assume it will be in February probably sometime. Just for the reference for that, on page three, um, that the, the discussion with Gemma and the last two points in there um, with the time scale is uh, quarter one in 2018 and the 31st of March 2018, that's when this will come back to this committee. Hope that's helpful. So we're happy to, yep, David. We've we've given a lot of assumption changes, and and uh, clearly uh, the the, uh, the the one that as councillors everybody's really interested in is is there likely to be an assumption that the contribution rate would not have to change. Now we looked at one of the graphs as though it might have to go up. I wasn't sure if I got that right or not. But have you made any sort of initial assumptions about that? Because Council budget settings in, in February, uh, so if we don't get the information till April, it could perhaps cause some difficulty. Yeah, interesting enough, uh, because you've had good asset growth over the last four years, you've got a, a much stronger asset base in the pension fund than you did last time, as, as we saw from the chart, your funding levels improved. So part of that, that stability mechanism. Uh, talk, can you hear me, Craig? That's better, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but part of that stability mechanism modelling, we're looking at uh, different scenarios there. So I talked about the plus and minus half percent of pay. But what, one of the scenarios is I think it would be safe to freeze the rate for three years. I think it might keep the fund safe. I haven't, I haven't got the results in modelling. But I, I think given your funding position, given what I know about what we did in England for funds that are of a similar ilk, sort of funding level, uh, one of the things I suspect I might be recommending here is a freeze to the council rate for three years rather than an increase clearly need to check that safe for the fund to do that in the back of the modelling talk to officers but uh and please don't quote me because it's still results still to be done but i i, I suspect you'll be okay in that respect and I, as looking at you know the way the improvement of funding level and the longer term i, I think it'd be a sensible thing to do but uh i just need to we need to just get the results of the modelling to officers and talk about that in a bit more detail is that another question? Obviously, there's 24 other employers there. Are, 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 did you find any particular risks in terms of changes to there? Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, we haven't yet finished the, the number crunching for, for those yet, but there are there are different risk profiles. Part of the, one of the things that's happened in the pension fund and with the regulator's oversight, you might be aware of the code of practice now, the regulator's involved in the fund, and they, they, they very, very much say, look at employer risk. LGPS funds need to look at employer risk and covenant financial strength of employers. So part and parcel of that is discussing with officers what, what the, the risk profiles are of the various employers. So some will be riskier than others. And how do we handle that risk? What does that mean for the contribution rate? So, so we use what we call a risk-based approach. For con I haven't covered that really today, uh, but that would be the plan would, you know, when we get the employer results to you is to explain how that works. But we'll feed in the employer risk into the contribution rate setting process because it's quite important because some have got a more, a more secure than others. And so it's important we, we make sure the pension fund's covered as well. Sorry, you, it's the first time I've been involved in this process. Yeah, yeah, no, so, I, so, uh, are you going to be bringing forward a range of different or potentially different changes to for, for, for different employers in terms of what, what proposals are? Uh, so sorry, that, that, that set of assumptions are, are still the underlying assumptions for each employer. But the way in which that affects their rate will very much depend on things like their time horizon, so the recovery period for any deficit. And that for a contractor, for example, that could be much a short time horizon because they're only in the fund for a small period of time or a closed body. So uh, whereas it would be a longer time horizon. So we, we use that set that assumption setting process gets used to feed into this risk-based approach. But within that approach, we build in things like employer risk. Uh, I haven't covered today because it's a topic in itself, but the the risk-based approach is really just projecting forward assets and liabilities for every employer to work out what a suitable contribution rate would be that keeps the fund safe. 
and we reflect employer risk in that process. Uh, but so what we're talking about today is just the set of assumptions used for the whole fund results. But when we set employer rates, we you know, we're looking at how what contribution rate would be appropriate based on a risk profile over their time horizon the fund and keeps the fund safe. So that, that's the sort of risk based approach in a nutshell. Uh, but I, I just haven't you know, but because we haven't got those numbers yet, uh, it would be easier to see it, I think, once we've got the, the numbers uh, ready. Just can I just ask Gemma to come in about that first point about the contribution rate? Yeah, sorry, it was just to reassure the committee that when the initial uh, valuation results are available, the uh, the head of finance and procurement will see those and they will be considered as part of budget set. And we have had some initial discussions about what they, they might be, but the, the, that rate uh, that would be set would be available for the budget setting process. Okay, so we, we noted that. Um, I'll move on to agenda item seven. Um, any other business? No. Uh, agenda item eight is the Local Government Scotland Act 1973. Are we happy to consider the adoption of resolution to exclude the public from the meeting in terms of section 50A4 and paragraph nine of part one of schedule 7A of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973? 